Hello and welcome once again to yet another discussion in Western Civilization. And this time we're going to be talking about the unification of Germany. <clears throat> so previously, when we had talked about the Revolution of 1848, there was an emphasis on the complicated role or relationship between liberalism and nationalism. Indeed, for the first half of the 19th century, nationalism was seen as an integral part of a liberal agenda. 1848 would begin a process of transformation in this regard. And one begins to see the migration of nationalism across the political spectrum as conservatives begin to recognize the great potential that nationalism offered them as a means of mobilizing public support, as a means of weakening liberalism by borrowing selectively from a liberal agenda. We've seen this in part with Louis Napoleon in his regime after the revolutions of 1848, adopting a liberal economic policy and certain other constitutional aspects of liberalism. In this lecture, we will see the way in which national sentiments could also be used for conservative purposes in Central Europe. We'll begin that discussion by looking at the case of Germany in Central Europe. At the conclusion of the regimes, uh, rather the revolutions of 1848 and into 1849, Frederick William IV had rejected what he called the crown from the gutter, offered to him by the delegates of the liberal Frankfurt Parliament. Frederick William IV refused this crown from the gutter, arguing that if the crowned princes of Germany offered him the crown, then he would be compelled to consider it but not from this illegitimate group of parliamentarians. In 1849 through 1850, however, Frederick William IV, especially in early 1849, when Austria was still very much consumed with maintaining order in the empire, which had virtually disintegrated, well, they were busy trying to hold the Habsburg Empire together. Frederick William IV was convinced that the time might be right to place himself at the head of a movement for national unification. From the princes, not from below. He put forward what was called a Prussian Union Plan in order to do this. And in 1850, when the Habsburgs had finally brought their empire back under control, the Habsburgs drew upon Russian support and forced Frederick William to back out of this Prussian Union Plan. This was called the humiliation of Olmutz. For the place where an agreement was signed between Austria, Prussia, and Russia, in which the Habsburgs had successfully convinced the Russians that this effort at a Prussian Union plan to unify Germany, although it was led by Frederick William, 
led by a conservative king, was in fact simply a hangover from the revolutionary days of 1848. Austria then emerged from the revolutions of 1848 and from this humiliation of Olmutz in 1850 as the leading German power. The German Confederation, which had been established at the Congress of Vienna, this loose confederation of German states, was restored in 1849, as if nothing had ever happened under permanent Austrian presidency. Austria was shaken by the revolution of 1848, but miraculously had managed to reassert itself. It remained, of course, mistrustful of all nationalist enterprise, especially in Germany. So Prussia began the decade of the 1850s in a very precarious position. On the one hand, humiliated by the Austrians after the Prussian Union plan, as if the Hohenzollerns had attempted too much, and Frederick William IV was compelled to recognize the leadership of Austria within the German Confederation. However, the Hohenzollerns had economic weapons at their disposal, which they would use very skillfully through the decade of the 1850s. The 1850s would be a decade of enormous economic expansion in Germany. The real takeoff phase of industrialization in Germany would occur in the 1850s, an enormously prosperous era, an era in which, despite the restoration after the revolutions of 1849, virtually all the German states had adopted a liberal economic policy. Prussia foremost amongst them. And German industrialization displayed rates of growth that were absolutely phenomenal in this decade. One of the central reasons for this was that although Germany did not have a united political organization, it did have an increasingly well-integrated economic organization, a national market arising out of what had been called the Prussian Customs Union, or the Zoldrin. This customs union had been founded in Prussia in the aftermath of the Congress of Vienna. It had gradually expanded through the 1820s. And by the 1830s, all the major states of German Central Europe had become members of the Prussian Customs Union, except the Austrians. Prussia had consciously kept the Habsburg monarchy out of this customs union. How had this been done? Prussia, in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, had adopted a policy of economic liberalism, of laissez-faire and free trade, lowering tariffs in international trade. But ironically, this politically conservative Prussian aristocracy 
with its grain-producing estates, represented the most dynamic sector of the Prussian economy, and they sold for export. They sold grain in Western Europe and England, and amazingly enough, in Russia as well. So they were quite keen on the idea of free trade, so that the Prussian economic system from a very early day winds up being something of an oxymoron. It is liberal economic policy in a conservative state. The attraction of belonging to a national market proved to be irresistible for the smaller German states, so that by the 1830s, by 1834, all the major states were part of this customs union, with, of course, the exception of the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs didn't feel they could join because they didn't believe their industries, their commerce, was strong enough to stand international competition. And so they always wanted to have high tariffs. The Prussians pushed, however, to have low tariffs. And very shrewdly, especially in the 1850s, what one sees is the Hohenzollern monarchy clearly playing second fiddle politically to the Habsburgs. The Hohenzollerns, when the Habsburgs in effect applied for membership in the uh, Prussian uh, customs union, suggested they wanted to join. The Prussian response was always the same. Oh, absolutely, yes, we want you to be members of the Prussian uh, um, Customs Union. We want you to be in here. That would be marvelous. Then, having agreed in principle, the Prussians would cause all sorts of objections, constantly, consistently, lowering tariffs, so that instead of raising tariffs to accommodate the Habsburgs, they continuously lowered them, so the Habsburg monarchy's important industrial interests and other economic interests. They said, therefore, that they couldn't join, that it was impossible under such conditions. And so the Habsburgs would be excluded by themselves. As a result of the policies of the Prussian Customs Union, liberal business interests all over Germany, who were disappointed, had been relentlessly disappointed by the conservative policies of the Hohenzollerns, in a political sense, were drawn to Prussian leadership in economics. Prussia was going to be the leader for any move for German national unification. Not, they felt, because of some sort of romantic nationalist notion, but because Prussia's economic policies represented the wave of the future. That Prussia, with its liberal economic policy, was slowly creating a German national economy. Therefore, the Hohenzollerns were the only real candidates to lead Germany to national unification and national unification business interests all over Germany, from Munich to Stuttgart to Cologne to Dresden to 
Hamburg, all of them understood if Germany were going to be able to sustain itself, to create prosperity, and to sustain that prosperity, it was going to have to be able to compete internationally. And this would require Germany to have a common currency, common weights and measures, some sort of national economic market. This was what the Prussian Customs Union was slowly, piece by piece, introducing. In many respects, it is similar to what one sees in the evolution of the European Union, the common market in the European Union after the Second World War in Europe. Even Frederick William IV, a man of quite reactionary orientation, a man who was not known for his political acuity, in the 1850s, he recognized the important weapon that the Prussian Customs Union, Zolverin, represented in its dealings with the Habsburgs, and that it gave Prussia the lead in any sort of movement for national unification. In 1858, Frederick William IV, who had begun having alarming mental lapses, conducted one too many conversations with the portraits on the walls of the palace and was set aside. He was followed by William the First, the first. And between 1858 and 1862, William I's reign in Prussia was called the New Era. It was a period when liberals thought that maybe he will be more liberal than Frederick William IV. He proved not to be, in a political sense, but he will continue the Prussian Customs Union policy. But in 1862, a constitutional crisis arose in Prussia, and William I turned for a political ally to a man of impeccable conservative credentials. For his prime minister in this situation, the man was a Prussian Junker, a Prussian nobleman, by the name of Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck became chief minister of Prussia in 1858 to shore up the monarchy against a challenge from a liberal majority in the Prussian Chamber of Deputies. Bismarck had very good conservative credentials. He had been active during the revolution of 1848 as a genuine reactionary, and he was determined to maintain above all else the power and independence of the Prussian crown. He was not going to allow the Prussian parliament to impinge on the power of the Prussian crown. Bismarck, while a conservative, had undergone, however, something of a metamorphosis in the years since 1848. His objectives were certainly conservative, maintain the power of the Prussian crown, and extend the influence of Prussia. But his methods, his ways of approaching those objectives, had been influenced by what he had seen 
in France. He'd been ambassador to France. He had watched. He'd listened to the various discussions of political transformation, the possible utility of nationalism, for example, as a conservative item. Bismarck had become the exponent par excellence of something called real politic. It meant a policy of realism. It meant using whatever methods, whatever means, were necessary. If they seemed liberal, if they seemed even radical, in order to achieve his conservative objective. Then this was what had to be done. He embarked upon a course that would ultimately lead to German unification under Prussian leadership. But he was not a doctrinaire conservative. He hoped to use nationalism as a means of splitting the liberal movement, of weakening the liberal movement in Prussia and in Germany as a whole. Above all else, and I think this needs to be understood, Otto von Bismarck was not a German nationalist. He cared very little at all about some larger something called Germany. He was a Prussian first, he was a Prussian second, and he was a Prussian third. He was interested in national unification under one condition only, and that is that it should take place under the auspices of Hohenzollern monarchy. In order to achieve his goals, he believed in foreign policy, that several steps had to be taken. First, he had to deal with the Habsburgs, and that meant to isolate them diplomatically. He had learned the lesson of Olmutz, which was that Prussia, acting alone in Germany, was not strong enough to deal with the Habsburgs. And so he needed to have good relations with the Tsar, with Russia. In 1863, an uprising of Poles in the Russian part of Poland, Bismarck was able to send support to the Tsar to help put down this uprising cementing good relations between St. Petersburg and Berlin. Bismarck also understood the diplomatic importance and the strategic importance of the Prussian customs system. That is, he continued the policy of Frederick William IV and his predecessors, agreeing that Austria should join, and then making it absolutely impossible for Austria to join. In fact, in 1863, when other members of the German Customs Union, the Prussian Customs Union, expressed their concern that tariffs were being lowered too much too fast, Bismarck responded by lowering them even more, forcing the German states basically to choose. Either you were with us or you were not. All of them followed Prussia in its continued policy of economic liberalism. In addition, Bismarck sought good relations with the kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont to the south, realizing, of course, that the great roadblock 
to Italian unification, which the House of Savoy was interested in, was to be found in Vienna. So this would be a good ally for the Prussians in the South. In 1864, a diplomatic situation developed in two northern provinces, technically part of the German Confederation, but reclaimed by the crown of Denmark. These are the provinces of Schleswig and Holstein. I'm not going to go into details of it. It was famously complicated, with dynamic interests and claims being made here and there, an issue so complicated that Lord Palmerston of Great Britain remarked at one point that only three people had ever understood it. One was Prince Albert, and he's dead. The other was a German professor, and he went mad. And I'm the third, and I've forgotten everything I know about it. Nonetheless, in 1864, Bismarck was able to cobble together an alliance of Austria and Prussia to free these northern provinces of Germany from the Danes, from any sort of claim from the Danes. So liberals looked to Bismarck as well. He's championing the notion of German unification, of a Germany against the Danes. But Bismarck wasn't interested in the Danish issue for this reason. And in 1866, he managed to maneuver the Habsburgs into a confrontation with Germany. Again, the details are extraordinarily intricate and complicated. What he really wanted to do was to force the Habsburgs out of their permanent presidency of the German Confederation. He managed to put forward a proposal for a new constitution for the German Confederation, which would be based on universal male suffrage. Conservatives in Prussia said, what are you doing? What is this? Universal male suffrage. Bismarck insisted on it. The Habsburgs said no, and said the Prussians had no right to be fooling around with a constitutional order in Germany. And one thing led to another. Bismarck pro provoked the confrontation with the Habsburgs. And in 1866, Prussia and Russia, <laughs> I'm sorry, Prussia and Austria went to war. It's very interesting. All of Prussia's economic allies, the other German states, members of the Prussian Economic Union, sided with Habsburgs. And yet, within less than six weeks, Prussia inflicted a devastating defeat on the Austrians using mobilization techniques. Here one sees industrialization come to play a role in war that it had never done before. The Prussians used their railway system. They mobilized their army incredibly quickly defeated the Habsburgs in very short order and drove the Austrians out of Germany. The defeat of the Habsburgs by the Hohenzollerns would lead Bismarck to create something called the North German Confederation, an alliance of states across northern Germany leaving the South German states aside, Bavaria, Württemberg, Baden, so on. 
These were largely Catholic, and Bismarck believed the rest of Europe, meaning France in particular, would never stand for a German move for unification at this point. This North German Confederation thrilled liberals in many ways. Here was this conservative taking these steps that look like it was going to bring Germany to some form of unification. Bismarck drafted a constitution for this North German Federation with liberal economic policy. That's laissez-faire, low tariffs. That's liberal, universal male suffrage. That certainly had been part of the liberal agenda. He also annexed outright the Kingdom of Hanover to Prussia. Legitimate conservatives said, what? We're absolutely baffled by this. How could a man, a representative of the Hohenzollern crown, simply annex a legitimate monarchical state? Bismarck did it because this would link up Prussia's territories in the east with their territories on the Rhine and would solidify this North German Confederation. He couldn't have cared less about the principle of legitimacy. So although he's a conservative, he is hardly an heir of Clemens von Metternich. Bismarck had hoped in 1866 through 67 that this victory over the Habsburgs, driving the Habsburgs for the first time in a thousand years, the Habsburg monarchy was not to be the major power in Germany. He'd hoped that this would create a surge of support for a united Germany in the South German states as well, but it did not. In elections to the regional parliaments in the South German states, opponents of unification under Prussian auspices won in Bavaria, in Baden, and elsewhere. But Bismarck insisted that there be treaties signed with the South German states, which bound them to Prussia economically. Of course, but also the Prussian military advisors were to be sent to the South German states to coordinate military policy so that in the event that they were threatened by invasion, then there would be a common German defense policy. Who would be likely to invade the German states in 1866? Bismarck was counting on some sort of threat from the Second French Empire and Louis Napoleon. The point that I want to underscore with all of this is not to familiarize you with the domestic politics of Bavaria or Baden. The important point to understand from this is that there was no great groundswell of public support for national unification in Germany in the southern German states at this point. National unification they were interested in, but Prussia, under Prussian domination, seemed a high price to pay. Bismarck clearly needed an issue to push the situation towards unification. And that issue would be provided by a very unlikely opportunity. In 1868, a liberal revolt had overthrown the corrupt regime 
of Isabella II of Spain. And in the following year, the provisional government had searched for a new monarchical family. They had gone through the various possibilities around Europe. Noble families from Italy, Portugal, and a number of German princes had all been approached. Most had refused. But finally they settled on one candidate, and that was Prince Leopold of Hohenzollern Sigmaringen. This is the Catholic branch of the Hohenzollern family, not part of the Prussian kingdom, but in the southwest. French objections to this were very strong. They didn't want to see the possibility of a France surrounded by a Hohenzollern-dominated Spain, as well as a Hohenzollern-dominated Germany. So Bismarck had here the potential issue that he wanted. He had worked behind the scenes very diligently to have the Spanish Parliament offer the crown of Spain to this Hohenzollern prince. He maintained that he had nothing to do with it, that the Hohenzollern family in Berlin had nothing to do with it. But in fact, Bismarck had been bribing Spanish lawmakers, had been using all of his influence to have the crown offered. When it was accepted, the Spanish botched the job in the sense that instead of the Spanish Parliament actually voting to give the crown to this Hohenzollern prince, the provisional government of Madrid simply announced it. And so it sounded like exactly what it was, a trumped-up sort of situation. Response in Paris was predictable. The French demanded a withdrawal of the Hohenzollern candidate for the crown of Spain, and pressed their ambassador in Berlin to approach the king, William I, about withdrawing. William had no really strong opinions about this. He felt that he didn't need this sort of trouble. He was approached not in Berlin, but as he was taking his vacation in the German spa town of Bad Ems in southwest Germany. The French ambassador approached him as he was taking his walk along the canal. It was a very friendly discussion. The French ambassador said, we really want you to do withdraw. And uh, the uh, king William I said essentially that he'd already done this, that he wasn't going to press the issue. But this hadn't satisfied the French. And so the ambassador wanted a written guarantee from the Germans that there would be no revival of this candidacy. And William said that they didn't need this, that he'd have to think about it, but that they really didn't need it. And the French ambassador left. William left, got on a train, go back to Berlin, thinking about the situation on the train ride. Bismarck got hold of this report about this encounter and drafted what came to be known as the Ems Dispatch, in which he took this incident 
and made it appear that the French ambassador had stormed up to William I, demanding that William I withdraw, that it had been a confrontation, that the honor of the Hohenzollern family had been impugned, and that William had stood his ground. Bismarck redrafted this dispatch, made it seem like this, sent it out to all the Prussian newspapers and government foreign office representatives around Europe. When William I got to Berlin the next morning, he discovered that instead of what had been a pleasant afternoon with a tiny encounter with the French ambassador, was now developing into a war situation. There were demands for war with France in Berlin, as well as certainly demands for war coming from Paris. Bismarck had maneuvered Louis Napoleon into exactly the position he wanted to be in. Under pressure from his own Chamber of Deputies, Napoleon III, as he now called himself, Emperor of the French, declared war on Prussia. All of the German states responded exactly as Bismarck had hoped that they would. If Prussian economic leadership and a general notion of German nationalism hadn't been enough to unify the German states, a fear of a French invasion would. Here one sees the legacy of all of the poems, the plays, and so on about German national unity from the days of the Wars of Liber Liberation come into play. All of the German states threw their support behind Prussia. Their military policies were coordinated with that of the Prussian army. The Prussians mobilized enormously quickly. And in what came to be known as the miracle of Sedan, on September the 1st, as French troops moved toward the frontier of northern Germany, the Germans bypassed the strategic French fortresses and enveloped the French armies around this crucial town of Sedan. Napoleon III was amongst the troops there. A breakout was impossible. Battle ensued. 13,000 French troops were killed. 30,000 were captured, including the emperor. This was a devastating defeat. In all, the emperor, 40 generals, and 83,000 troops would ultimately surrender within the next couple of days. It was a miraculous defeat of France by Bismarck and the Prussian military forces. There was enormous enthusiasm in German Central Europe. Enormous enthusiasm for this victory over France. Not necessarily for German unification, <coughs> excuse me, but for the victory over France. German armies continued to move into France proper, surrounding Paris which continued to hold out even after the surrender of the emperor. And in a way of adding insult to injury, on January the 9th, 1871, at the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, the various German princes offered the crown of a new German empire to William I of Prussia. So the German empire the unified Germany was declared and created on French soil 
in 1871. Even after the defeat of Napoleon, German troops continued to fight. One very prominent German figure was asked, Against whom do you fight now that Napoleon III has been vanquished and the French defeated? The reply was, We're fighting against Louis XIV, so that he sees the continuity of this enmity. In January of 1871, Germany, a Germany without Austria, had been united under Prussian auspices. The German Reich, the word for empire, the second one, would now come into existence. What's important to remember here is that in the final analysis, German unification was not the result of some sort of mass nationalism, some sort of grassroots sentiment for German unification, but it was the product of Prussian military power and the astute diplomacy of Otto von Bismarck. And with that, we'll end the German unification and pick up in the next lecture with the Italian unification. Thank you.